Not one. Hello, everybody. Today is Wednesday, one o'clock. It usually means we are here at Ruach. We are, we are in for a good program, but before we do, I would like to tell our thank our sponsors. Today's sponsors are Karen, Marvin, Sperling, and family. They are sponsoring in commemoration of uh, Marvin's mother, Lori Sperling. Also, also, Deborah and Larry Zwani commemorating the Schleusheim of Deborah's mother, Violet Penina Black. Violet was a member of us. She came almost every week. She lit up the room with her smile when she came, and we're certainly going to miss her. Thank you for the sponsors. And now let's go for Aviva, who is going to introduce our distinguished speaker. Have a good time, everybody. Thank you, Vera. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce art and Judaica collector Richard Rinberg, who will give us a presentation on the oldest institution in modern Israel and how it has shaped the country's cultural identity. So my pleasure to welcome Richard Rinberg. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aviva, and thank you, Vera. Uh, tonight, as we're going into this period here in Israel, I say tonight, we're just going into the period of Shiva Asa Batamuz and the, uh, the three weeks. We turn our attention in, in, in traditionally to Jerusalem um, so I thought I'd talk about the Basalo School of Art in Jerusalem. I tell the technical uh, lady that I've got this uh, square in the middle of my screen that seems to come and go. I'm not sure where it's come from. It's, it's gone, it's coming back. Uh, if you can't see it, that's wonderful. It doesn't worry me. So let me talk about Basalo, and you can see a picture here from 1913 and the two buildings that you can go and see today um, and the gentleman in the Piff helmet uh, standing is Boris Schatz, who is a major figure we're going to see about Boris Schatz. And I just draw your attention to this sorry, door, which is- Sorry to interrupt. Door. Yeah, we see that box, but I'm not sure what it is. I think it's on your computer. I've never seen it before. No, neither have I. This is very strange. Well, let, <laughs> let's keep going and see if it disappears, but there's not a lot I think I can do about it, unless you want me to stop share. And I'm going to try sharing again and see if that gets rid of it. So um, let me go to the beginning of the story and you have to start somewhere. I'll start with Der Judenstadt, the Jewish state, a book by Herzl in 1896, where he proposes, and you can see the search, Versuch modernen Lösung der Judenfrage the modern solution, a modern solution for the Jewish question. And in that book, he writes, the best way to avoid anti-Semitism in Europe is to create an independent Jewish state. And he also writes, we have no flag, we need one. If we desire to lead many men, we must raise a symbol above their heads. And here's his drawing of the flag. And you can see he's taken the Star of David, the Magen David. Um, he takes that sign because it's on synagogues all over Europe. It's known as a Jewish sign, um, but it's not actually allied to any particular um, movement, especially religious movement as such. So it's a, a power of sign, shall we and say. This, for is the area, this is the area of Arven. And you can see seven stars and they represent the days of the week. Now, the first conference is going to be in 1897 in Basel. It's meant to be in Munich, but there's a problem with the rabbis in Munich uh, because uh, Herzl's idea is very much political Zionism, nothing to do from his perspective with religion. And of course, the rabbis are against this. So he shifts it to Basel. And here you have a postcard from 1897. And where I put the red arrow, that's the casino where the um, first Zionist Congress is going to take part and almost 200 people are going to attend from 17 different countries. Some will be official delegates of the Jewish community in those countries. Others will just be people who are interested to attend. And you can see in the postcard, they picked up on Herzl's idea of the Magin David, 
with the lion rampant, if you want the Ariyeh Yehuda, the Lion of Judah, with the seven stars. Now here's a very bad photograph, and it's the best photograph I could find of the first conference in 1897. And the only figure you can really make out well is Max Nordau, who's the deputy to Herzl with his beard. And you can see the flag above them that they put on the wall, very much Herzl's idea for the flag. And you get a feeling for how the conference is. Remember that Herzl is a man of the theater. So he makes sure everybody dresses for the occasion. And in fact, when Max Nordau turned up that evening to the conference or the first morning to the conference, Herzl sent him home to change into formal attire. Because you, if you want to be taken seriously, you have to dress seriously. Now here's a participant's card from the first conference. And what you can see on the left, the Kotel, and you've got the religious Jews who are praying. And in fact, woman there, so men and women together, no mechitza, uh, no division between them and no argument. And then on the other side of the card, a Jewish peasant who's from their perspective in Palestine, sowing the seeds. And this is taking place in August 97, 1897. You can see the Star of David. And interestingly enough, very sexist, the cards were printed for Mr but this was actually a ladies card. There were a few women at that conference. And here's a postcard. They were very big on memorabilia and postcards were very much something that was used in these years for uh, people to send from the Zionist conference. And you've got the same pictures as we saw on the participants card, but you've also got in Hebrew, Mi Yitain Mitzion Yeshuat Yisrael. And they're gonna pick up, and we're gonna see this again and again, they're going to pick up from um, the uh, Masoret from the traditional writings, from Tehillim, from the Psalms. And you can see here are the words written on the card. And this is the translation I've put in in English. But what's interesting is you could read this in a number of ways. You can read it as the traditional translation, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. But you could also read it, me yitain Yeshuat, or me yitain Zion Yeshuat. Who's going to give the salvation to Israel? And of course, it's going to be the Zionist Congress. Now, at the meeting, the Basel program um, is established, and this is the aim of the Zionist uh, movement, and it's to establish a home in Palestine for the Jewish people. And the Congress agreed, one, to promote the settlement of agriculturalists, artisans, tradesmen in Palestine. So they want a real economy. They want this to be a self-sustaining enterprise. They don't want it to be, as is in the Yishuv, a chalukah, where you collect money and you distribute it. They also want to federate the Jews locally and strengthen Jewish uh, um, consciousness. Now here's the second conference, and you can see number two there, and there's the Zionist flag. It's taking place in Basel again. You've got the Kotel again with the religious Jews praying, and on the other side, you've got the Jewish peasants sewing. But if you look at the face of the peasant, very much Herzl's face. This is the idea. And you've got somebody else working in the rays of the sun. They've picked up from Yechezkel, from Ezekiel. I'm going to take the children of Israel from amongst the nations and bring them into their own land. Now, fascinating to me is because if I'd have drawn this, not that I have any talent for drawing, I would not have put in these extra two features. One is this architectural detail, which is very much Islamic or Ottoman, if you want, or Arab, um, very much to do with Muslim, to do with Islam, if you want. And this lady here, you look closely, she's clearly a nun. This is a Christian nun reading her Bible because they're writing here, yes, the Jews, it's their place, and I'm going to take the Jews out of the other nations, and here they're represented. Now, when you go um, later on in the same year, uh, Herzl is going to go to Israel, to Palestine at the time, to try and meet with his delegation, Kaiser Wilhelm. This is a setup that uh, Herzl is working towards. He's a man of the theater and he knows how important it is to have the photo opportunity. And here's a nice photograph of the emperor and his wife, uh, actually in the Jaffa Road where the Jewish community put up this arch, Augusta Victoria, uh, because Kaiser Wilhelm II is actually the oldest grandchild of Queen Victoria. And here's a, a, a good rule for all of us. Never ever let a friend 
uh, be at your simcha to take the important photographs because they'll miss it. Because one of the delegation, David Wolfson, who's a friend of Herzl, is asked to take the photograph of Herzl meeting the Kaiser. And picture A, this is actually the photograph he took. And I put the arrow to Herzl's foot. That's all that gets in the photograph. And there is the Kaiser on his horse looking down at Herzl, who's completely missing from the photograph. So a few days later, Wolfson is going to take this photograph of Herzl. This is actually, all of this takes place at the entrance to Mikveh Yisrael, which is set up in 1870, is the first agricultural uh, school, if you want, in, in Palestine, in the Yishuv. And then they're going to cut and paste and talk about fake news. They're going to take the emperor off the white horse at the front, put him on the dark horse at the back, take Herzl, who's there, and stick him there. And there you have him. But interestingly enough, you can see his pith helmet, which is facing down, looks a little bit like Herzl's a supplicant, if you want. That's going to change. Uh, and you'll see uh, here in this modern day sculpture, you see how the pith helmet has been moved around. So you can see that in, in McVeigh Israel if you go there today. And here's the third Zionist conference in 1899, a year later, um, in August. And again, you've got the religious elderly and now the, the, the peasant farmers, if you were, getting a bracha just before they go off to work. And then the next year, the Zionist conference is actually going to move to London, England, the year 1900. And here you've got the religious again on the left. You can see the strimal. And you've got, if you want, the wandering Jew, because he's got the stick and the sack. And he's being shown by the angel who's got a halo, except the halo is a Magen David, looking towards Palestine. And you can see they're collecting dates or it's agricultural. So the so, so, same sort of theme all the time. Now, this is really where I wanted to get to, the fifth Zionist conference in 1901. It's gone back to Basel. And the art has now stepped up a notch. This is by E.M. Lillian. The printer of this made a mistake. His name, his name is Ephraim Moshe Lillian. We're going to see him again. And he designs this card. And it's the which we know very well from the Shemona Esrei. And our eyes shall see your return to Zion in mercy. You've got on the left, the religious Jew with thorns around him, the angel with the Magen David on the chest, pointing towards the Yeshua, the salvation. And here you've now got a religious Jew plowing into the sun, which is either rising or setting. Um, and you've got these ears of corn, because this is going to be a very successful enterprise. Now, at the Fifth Zionist Conference, Max Nordown, this is actually a Lillian uh, engraving drawing of him. On the first day, Max Nordown announces there's going to be a display of Jewish art in the room in the Congress building. This is a very big deal. Up until now, there's been a battle. This is all been about political uh, Zionism. And now it's going to change because they're going to bring in a bit of culture. So this is a very, very big deal. This is the first time in history that there's actually been a Jewish art exhibition, not an individual artist who may be Jewish, but some pieces of art that are defined as Jewish art. And they're going to be 48 pieces of art from 11 artists. And some of the organizers include, here's a very young Martin Buber, not a picture we're used of him, the Austrian Jewish philosopher who's going to end up in Jerusalem. Uh, here's Lillian himself, Ephraim Moshe Lillian, HaKohen. And he's called now the first Zionist artist. We're going to see a lot of his work. And a name we know full well, Chaim Weizmann. Um, and you can see they were all born pretty much at the same time. Um, young men here at the conference. And here's a picture uh, of a particular faction, the democratic faction. Here's Herzl in the middle, here's Chaim Weizmann, here's Lillian the artist, here's Martin Buber. And here's one of the pieces of art that was shown. Now, the actual art often wasn't shown. It was reproductions that was shown, photographs. And this is Benderman's The Grieving Jews in Exile from Tilim by the rivers of Babylon. We sat down, we wept when we remember Zion, very appropriate for this time of year. You can see the chains. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of art. Surprising that this was shown because Benderman actually converted to Christianity. So it's surprising. I mean, can one call this Jewish art? And that's a whole nother debate and a whole another issue, but obviously on a very, very Jewish topic. And here's another piece 
of very Jewish art. Today it's in Tel Aviv by Maritzi Gottlieb, who's called the uh, Rembrandt of Poland. Uh, Jews praying in the synagogue, whoops, on Yom Kippur. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to change so quickly. Um, this is a very complicated painting. This is Gottlieb himself. Uh, and these are members of his family. And this is him as a child. There's a lot one could say about this painting. Uh, in fact, the painting itself is huge. It's life size. So it wasn't the painting that was shown. It was a photograph. And here's another piece that was shown at that exhibition, Joseph Israels, and here from Shmuel Aleph. The idea that Shaul, King Saul, when he was depressed, feeling down. So here's King David, or David as a young boy, playing the harp to give him relief. And here's, I think, the last piece I'm going to show of these pieces of art, a Lillian piece. And again, you get the idea, the religious Jew with the thorns looking towards Sion on the right. And here we've got the pyramids and Egypt and it's very much called Golos, right? Galutz, the diaspora. Uh, he was a fantastic artist, Lillian. Now, at the Fifth Zionist Conference, uh, in fact, Lillian takes this very famous photograph of Herzl who's in the hotel out on his balcony. Um, it's now iconic, this. Um, but Boris Schatz, who is a Lithuanian sculptor, um, actually attends the conference and meets uh, Herzl and hears him and is really impressed by what he hears. And he's going to write to Herzl with an idea of founding an art school. And he's going to write to him in 1902 and a year later, they're actually going to meet in Vienna in 1903. And for an hour, Schatz is going to present his idea to Herzl. And Herzl hears him out and at the end says, it's a worthy cause. What name will you give the school? And Schatz replies to him, but Salel, after the first master craftsman, obviously from the Bible, but Salel, who in olden times built a temple in the wilderness. And Herzl is very moved and he says, a temple in the wilderness. Now Schatz is going to see himself as a high priest of this new temple in the wilderness, this Bet HaMikdash, this new Bet HaMikdash dedicated to art. And never forget, Herzl is a man of the theater. Here's one of his plays, The New Ghetto. This is uh, Vienna in those years. But he's very much one who realizes that images are extremely important. Now, 1903 is gonna be a year of disaster. For the Jewish world, there's the pogrom in Kishinev. 49 Jews are murdered, 1,500 homes are ransacked, Many, many people are injured. It's terrible what goes on and seems to be uh, with the agreement, shall we say, of the Russian authorities. The police stand by and let this happen. So the Jews are in shock. And this is Lillian's drawing of that. Uh, Lemetim to the, to the people who died, Al Kiddush Hashem Bekishnev, uh, for sanctification of the name. And you can see this bound Jew and an angel. Um, but it was also a year of disaster personally for Boris Schatz, because this is his wife, Jenya and their little child, Angelica. And she unfortunately is going to have an affair with one of his students and run off and take the child with her. This leaves Schatz completely devastated. He's actually a very decorated man. He's in Bulgaria. The king of Bulgaria had got Schatz to come and establish the National uh, uh, Art College in Bulgaria, which is a new state that's been formed. Um, and Schatz is, is now devastated, and that's why he's open to actually leaving all this behind him, leaving Europe and setting out for somewhere near. Now, 1904 is another year where bad things happen in terms of the Zionist movement, because Herzl, who's born 1860, he's only 44, he has a heart attack and dies. And in fact, the day before, he knows his health is giving out. He says, greet Palestine for me. I gave my heart's blood for my people. And this is his funeral in Vienna. You see reports 6,000 people turned out. And this is a plaque by Schatz, the sculptor. He does many of these different sorts of plaques. And this is one of Herzl where you see Moses looking out from Har Nevoh, from Mount Nebo over the land because Moses actually never makes it into the land. Well, Herzl did make it once on a visit, but he's not going to make it to the nation that he believes is going to be formed in the future, which is what all the writing is all about. Um, and in fact, the state of Israel, 100 years after the death of Herzl, is going to have this stamp. And of course, the famous comment, Im tirzu in zu if you will it, it's no fairy tale. Uh, and here's a, I'm jumping the gun a bit with this, a, a Zev Rabban uh, with the same sort of uh, motifs on it. We'll see Zev Rabban in a sec. 
Now, Bart uh, Schatz is going to write a postcard to this lady in Odessa in 1905. He has to go off to America. Uh, this is actually to do with uh, Bulgaria. But he said, in a few months, I'll be traveling to Palestine to organize the school of which I'd long dreamt for. And here he is by his most famous sculpture, which has gone missing. Uh, it's called Matit Yahu, uh, Matit Eyes, from the Hanukkah story. And it becomes an iconic piece we're going to see again and again. Um, 1st of March, 1906, the Salah School of Art actually opens its doors in Jerusalem because Boris Schatz is going to come actually with Lilian. They come from Berlin. And in fact, the committee that establishes it is in Berlin. And the first students are enrolled. And the art instruction is focused on handicrafts rather than fine arts. And here is the, uh, the, semel, the symbol that Lilian comes up with. And you can see this emblem designed by Lilian has the two cherubs, the Kruvim, the, the same as on the Ark of the Covenant, shall we say, in ancient times from, from Tanakh. And here you can see, right, there's the Ark of the Covenant, and he's got the, the Luchot here as a symbol and the carrying handles. And it says, but Salel Yerushalayim. And here's a, actually a picture of Lillian, a photograph, which Lillian turns into a piece of art, an engraving. You can see what a fantastic draftsman. And he does an ex libris. This is a sticker that goes in a book for Boris Schatz, Dov Boris Schatz. And you can see Schatz as somebody closely aligned with the Ark of the Covenant. He's now carrying, as it were, it forward. He's now the high priest in the Bet Mikdash from his point of view. And interestingly enough, these set squares and such like, he was a Mason. So some of this is actually the iconography of, of the Masonic. Uh, he's a lodge member. Now, what's the aim and the purpose? And these are actually in the words of Boris Schatz. Kol Yisrael yesh lem chelek b'tzalel, b'tzalel. He's taken that obviously from Pirkei Avot, that everybody in Israel has a share, chelek, right? But olam haba, in the world to come. And he says, no, everyone's got a share in b'tzalel. And it was founded with the object of developing art, pure as well as industrial in the land of Israel, to teach Jewish children, to draw, paint, make beautiful objects. And this is the sort of thing, it was strange to the Jews on the whole, because they never had the chance to do this in the shtetl. And here's the B'tzalel flag, again with the symbol. And you can see Beit Midrash. They're taking this, as it were, from the religious world and turning it into the secular world. A house of learning, a Beit Midrash. La Amanut, to art. Amanut. So it's to art, it's the arts and crafts movement. But it's the Beit Midrash, it's where you go to study art. And here's the first building in 1907 that they rent in Ethiopia Street. And you can see Betzalel Kunzgewerbe is Arts and Crafts, the School for Arts and Crafts. And here's Schatz in the middle with the people he's got together. And you're going to see a lot of young children. They're going to be teaching. Today it would be called slave labor because you're going to see them at work. And here in 1908 in Ethiopia Street, where the first school is, you've got the people cutting the stones for the Department of Sculpture. But they're going to move to Shmuel Hanagid Street and they're going to, in fact, it's the JNF is going to, the Jewish National Fund is going to purchase these two buildings that were originally built in the 18 entities by Effendi Abu Shakir. Effendi is like sir or um, an honorific in, in Arabic. And um, this is where the Batsalel School of Art historically is going to take place. And here's the door again to enter into the compound. Another picture from the Times. And you can see they put a menorah on the top. These, these all become iconic. Uh, and you've got the sign up that they took off the other building and put up. And here we've got a carpet weaving workshop. They're gonna slowly set up all sorts of classes in the evening, during the day, workshops. And here you've got some people being instructed by Shmuel Ben David. Here's the loom, the beginnings of a carpet coming up, often with Hebrew written in. And you can see the age of these people, quite young. And at the time, Rav Cook, who's going to become the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi, in 1908, he's going to write a famous letter to the founders of Batsal. Now, Rav Cook is very much from the religious side, but he's going to draw together. Rav Cook is one of these amazing individuals who can bring together all, uh, all sides of the equation. And he's got the heart of a poet. And you can read in his letter, he says, one of the definitive signs of rebirth is the praiseworthy work that's about to emerge from your admirable group. He doesn't call them a group of sinners. He says they're admirable, the rebirth of Hebrew art and beauty in the land of Israel. This vision is heartwarming because of the time I won't go through it all, but he's really praising them about what they're doing. 
and they actually give him Boris shots. I'm sorry it's not a particularly good reproduction. If it weren't for the whole thing going on at the moment, I would have gone to Jerusalem to get a better photograph. But this is supposedly the first carpet that came off the Batsala looms that was given to Rav Cook. I very much doubt it was the first carpet. It's too complicated. But it was certainly given to him and he had it up in his house. You can go and see it today in Jerusalem. Um, and on the carpet is written from Yeshayahu, Isaiah, and it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains. And here's the carpet and the iconography. They have no problem with Batsal saying, this is where the Har Habayat, the Bet HaMikdash site is. Now there's the Dome of the Rock, as we know, that's been there for hundreds of years. So they'll use it as the symbol. Today, you wouldn't use it as, as that symbol, but in those days they did. Palm trees, and we're gonna see other carpets much better later on. Now, Schatz is going to go around the world, actually, holding exhibitions, selling the sorts of items that Betzalel are going to make. Um, and here you've got a wooden plaque, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let that, my right hand lose its cunning. This is in Galicia, in Lvov, Lemberg, 1910. And you can see this sort of salver, which is Damascene work, in its copper, but inlaid with silver, uh, or brass inlaid with copper and silver. And there's a carpet on the wall of a menorah. Here's a sample of that carpet hanging on my wall. And you can see where the Luchatar but Salel Yerushalayim, um, and very much Art Nouveau, these cartouches round, you can see Tzion and But Salel. There's all sorts of designs in the But Salel carpets. And 1911, there's some nice photographs of, of Boris Schatz accepting new students, and you can see from above what Jerusalem looks like in those days. Um, and here's uh, much, much photography going on. A lot of it's used for advertising purposes. You can see Look at the average age of these people studying and working, I have to say there. Um, here's a carpet that's on my wall. It's very problematic from a religious point of view because here's Har Sinai with, you've got 10 trees, the Aserta of Dibrot, the 10 commandments. And on the right, you've got the Eshel Abraham. You've got Abraham's tree that he planted. Um, but it's contrasted on the left with Eris Herzl because when Herzl came to visit Palestine, he planted a cedar. And in fact, this is saying years ago it was Abraham in biblical times, and today we've got Herzl and they're equal. And in the middle, of course, you've got the uh, Sinai. And if you look at the design, it's a bit subliminally like the Ten Commandments on Luchot. So here's the tree that Herzl planted in 1922. Actually, the, there's, there's some problems. It's cut down. They take the uh, the Zionists uh, around actually take the uh, seeds from this tree and they plant them all around Israel. So Herzl's tree goes to be used for a forestation and here's a, a carpet showing just the tree of Herzl. And here's an art class going on and again you can see Boris Schatz in the center. Here's another art class and you can see one of the works by Jacob Eisenberg. He's going to be sent to Vienna to study ceramics and we'll see some of his work in a sec. Here's another art class, Abel Pan, a famous artist. This is one of his self-portraits um, taken in 1991. You're in Corona time. Uh, Somebody has a radio on, they're not on mute. So if you're not on mute, please go on mute. And here's the silver, silver department. And you can see they're all Yemeni. In, in the Yemen, the uh, Arab population see it as beneath them to actually be involved in metal work. So jewelry is done by the Jews. And look at the quality of some of this work. This is a mirror on the other side, but you've got Jacob and Rachel, this beautiful, beautiful mirror, which today is in the Israel Museum with filigree work and granulation, a particular sort of work set with semi-precious stones. Here's another beautiful, beautiful menorah. Again, you can see this quality of some of the workmanship, but a lot of the stuff is actually for the tourists, if you want, for people to buy. So they have these Hanukkah lamps with all different sorts of, of designs on them, the gazelle and the palm trees. Uh, here you've got Arya Yehuda, the lions. Here you've got the Maccabin cleaning the temple, uh, the Bar Kokhba coins. There's any number of designs that they have. Uh, here's the Department of Sculpture. And look when I put the red arrow, because there's a young lady here. And in fact, you've got a Yemeni. Why, why so many Temanim, Yemenis? I have to say it, but they, they, they felt they were cheap and therefore when you employ them you don't have to pay too much and when you have them uh, 
being as your models, you don't have to pay too much. And also they, they were chosen as the representative of the biblical Jew. So when you see a Yemeni, you're seeing back in time to what Abraham may have looked like. And this young lady, she's actually the only young lady of her year. Her name is actually Hadgadya. It's a nickname. She's actually, her name is Miriam or Marusia Nissenholz. Why is she called Hadgadya? There's a number of stories. Uh, one of the stories is, is that the, the, the male student said she used to skip around the hills of Jerusalem like a goat. So they called her Hadgadya, like the, the Pesach. And she said about herself in her diary, well, I was like uh, a little uh, um, um, animal amongst the wolves. So I was, I really felt under threat. So I called myself Hadgadya, the little kid amongst the wolves. And here she is in a plein air, an open uh, art class with Boris Schatz. She actually gets married. Uh, she goes to live in Cairo for a period and gets married to him. He becomes a spy for the British. But again, every slide I'm showing you, you could talk for an hour on each slide with what's going on. Um, there's going to be an exhibition in London. Here's Lady Swaysling. This is in the Baker Street. Uh, this is taking place in 1912, and it's for Betzalel, and also Evelina, Evelina de Rothschild. There's still the school in Jerusalem, the Evelina de Rothschild, who died young. And just to show you that, and again, I have to be careful because time is ticking, in this booklet, which goes with the, um, uh, with the exhibition, is this poem, there was a bazaar called Betzalel, for donations, the Jews lehit palel, to pray. When Heshat saw the figure, the amount of money, he grinned like a... I'll say shviga from Yiddish, but it's actually not. It's an N-word that nobody can use today. And he then hurried home to say halal, right, to give blessings. And this is the sort of poem which today would be completely off limits. And here's a picture of him in London in 1912. And then off he goes to Krakow, 1912. Uh, here's an exhibition poster there. And you can see the buildings uh, of Betzalel and a very oriental sort of figure. And they're going to have these exhibitions to sell their wares. Now, by the Jaffa Gate, they're going to build this showroom, shop in a showroom. And it's actually built of tin and wood. And you can see up there, but Salel. It was actually demolished in 1918 by the British. Um, and here's a catalogue from 1913 with all different sorts of wares. And where I've put the arrow, look at this beautiful piece of work, very much Turkish, if you want, or Arab. But to use for hand washing. And, and you can see the sort of imagery, uh, again, perhaps the biblical Betzalel looking at the menorah. And this is in the States, Madison Square Garden, 1914. There are going to be 20,000 visitors. All Jews are going to go to get a little bit for themselves. Um, Schatz wants everybody to have a, a room at home, an Israel room, where they can go. And obviously, it's going to be stuffed with his wares. Now, here's in the courtyard of Betzalel. And this is a... Uh, um, a sculpture of the Messiah. And here you've got Abel Pan and his wife and Boris Schatz and his second wife, Olga Schatz. And to show you this sculpture, you can see it's huge. It's actually gone missing. So if you have it, I'd really like to know where it is. But there are some copies, small sculptures of it that he did in London. His name was actually Chanoch, right? But he went to live in Italy. So from Chanoch, he went to Enrico, Enoch to Enrico Blickenstein. And here you can see, this is a plaque he did. In the right hand, you've got the, um, the shofar of the Mashiach. Um, and here you've got David's shield, which obviously King David never actually used. And here it says, Hashem, uh, Imi, God is with me, and he's in chains. And it very much looks like Herzl, and he's about to stand up when the Messiah comes. Here he is, and he's going to stand up. And here's some beautiful, beautiful bookbinding by Betzalel. Some of their, their stuff in the early period uh, is just gorgeous. And here's a project that Zeevra Bun, one of their major designers, produced. It's an Aron and Ark, which is now in the Spurtis Museum in Chicago. You can go and see it. And look at the detail. I can't spend time going through all the bits, but every part of the Batalel school was involved, whoops, sorry, in, in producing this from the enamel department to the metalwork department. Just gorgeous. Um, and here's a a card, King George V and Queen Mary, and you can see uh, Palestine Travels Publishers and Turkish troops driven from the outlying hills by our men. We're in the First World War, 1914-18, this is 1917. And in fact, in the Ottoman um, archives, you've got the actual photograph much better here. And here you've got the Batsayel building that's gonna be demolished. And these are the Turkish troops 
retreating. And here's a piece of trench art. Trench art is made by soldiers who are going to use anything they can and turn it into art. Now, in this period, the people in Jerusalem are really, really poor. There's not enough to eat. So they're going to use um, this uh, sort of material, which are um, um, brass cartridges, and they're going to uh, commemorate 9th of December 1917 when the British actually win and take over. Two sergeants actually are on a scouting mission and suddenly they see a group coming towards them who want to surrender. It's the Turkish army and they say we're only sergeants, we have to go and get an officer, you can't surrender to us. Um, and this shows you where they're getting all this material from. This is the cartridge case, you can see number seven. And I took this photograph from France. There are 3,000 shell casings. This is after a bombardment. And in fact, in World War I, there's 1.75 billion of these. So around Jerusalem, there are lots of cases. It's good material. They're going to go and pick it up. And very appropriately, they take this comment, right? They shall beat their swords into plowshares, right? From Yeshayahu, from Isaiah. And they're going to use what was an implement of war into a piece of of art, design. Here's another one commemorating uh, what went on, the liberation of Jerusalem, 1917. And here's Allenby who comes in on foot to show that his humility to taking over Jerusalem. And here's a carpet from Batsalel, 1920, showing the buildings. And again, I put the real buildings down there. They did a pretty good job. And they always take an appropriate pasuk verse from the Bible, right? And this is all about Batsalel in the Bible. I filled him with the spirit of God and in understanding and in workmanship. And here's a beautiful cabinet that I actually tracked down for a number of years with beautiful marquetry, shows the sort of work they were doing. Some of it was really high standard, a silver uh, platter for, for Pesach, right, to be used with beautiful imagery on it and a set of playing cards. And I have to be careful with the time, again, just to show you what they're doing. They're taking ordinary cards, this is the Duchifat company. A Duchifat is the Hooper, which is now the national bird of Israel. And let me just show you a little bit. Zev Rabban, who designs this, these are the original suits we all know, spades. He turns into menorah. And in fact, if you go to Neot Kudumim, you'll see that there's a plant called salvia, the sage, which is, they, some believe, is where the menorah design came from. He's going to take the hearts, flip it upside down, little chupchik on the end, and it becomes a pomegranate. The diamonds are going to become a star of David. And the clubs, well, some books say it's a fig leaf. I'm sure they're wrong. It's a vine leaf. I put both there. You can see the, the edges. And he's going to take for the court cards biblical figures, David Batsheva, Yoav, David's general. Uh, and this from the Purim story. I mean, Homon is a jack, right? It's, it's King Queen Jack. Esther is obviously the queen. Achashverosh is the king. And David and Melech, I don't know if you realize, in the ordinary playing pack of cards, David is actually King David, uh, sorry, the, the King of Spades, with Goliath's sword. That's where the imagery comes from. And here you've got David with the Star of David, David and Melech, obviously the harp, looks a bit like a guitar. And he's going to have for the Jack with Solomon and um, Queen of Sheba, he's going to have Ashmodai, which is really strange. It's this evil sort of angel. Um, and there's a blow up of it. And in fact, in, they know their Bible. If you look at uh, Kings 1, Malachi Malaf, you'll see that Solomon had at sea a navy and they brought to Israel every three years ivory, monkeys and peacocks. Well, there's a monkey and there is a peacock. Except if you're looking in the Gemara, in the Talmud, um, actually that peacock is the hoopoe bird. And there's a whole story about it. You have to look in the Talmud Babli Git in 68. And in fact, in the pack of cards done in the 50s, where Zev Rabban revamps it, he takes this evil angel and he makes him into the Joker. Um, I won't go into this now. Uh, as I say, there's just so much. This is a beautiful Rabban, Dev Rabban, who teaches at, um, and uh, works at the Batalio School of Art, showing him with his uh, hupo. Um, now I'm going to go to the ceramics I said before. Um, and again, just the quality of the work the ceramics department is doing. Um, an er an Eretz, right? Flowing with honey, and milk and honey. And you can see, the, again, an iconic image. And here, 
1917, the Turks are really worried about Europeans in Jerusalem. They kick them out. And Bezalel goes up north to Tiberias, Tiberia, and he actually writes a book, The Rebuilt Jerusalem, Yerushalayim Habanuya, A Daydream, Chalom Bekait. And he, he basically talks about Jerusalem 100 years in the future. And that 100 years in the future is actually a couple of years ago. And he says in that book, there's going to be a population of 10 million, which is unbelievable because he was pretty near the mark. What he got wrong was he said, and the economy will be one third the products of the Bezzalo School of Art. Well, it wasn't. Unfortunately, he got that wrong. Um, and here's another beautiful piece in the Israel Museum, an Elijah chair, again, a huge piece of work that, um, needing the input from many, many of the departments. Um, you can go and sit in the museum. And now some other ceramics. And we'll start with the Traveler's Prayer, Tfilat HaDerech. We all are looking forward to traveling again one day. And I'm going to take you on a trip down Hayarkon Street in Tel Aviv. And if you look at the sign of uh, Tel Aviv, and this is it, you see it all over the place. It says in Hebrew, I will build you and you will be rebuilt. Here's actually a 1922 photograph of Allenby Street, and you can see where the camels are. That's Allenby Street. And this is a photograph from 1924-25 when they're beginning to build the buildings. And the mayor, Mayor Diesengoff, is going to do a deal with the Bezzalo School of Art, and they're going to buy from them these ceramic plaques, which they're going to put up on buildings. And today you can do a wonderful tour and go and see these plaques. Uh, here's Achat Ha'am Street, the boys' school, and you can see just beautiful. Uh, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand, the poppies, right? There was the belief the blood of the soldiers who liberated, right, goes into the earth and the poppy grows and that's why it's blood red. These beautiful images, there are the Shvatim, the tribes of Israel, um, close up of one of the plaques, right? At a time when everybody and the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Um, on the, that building, you've got these beautiful plaques of different places, Haifa, Tiveria, this says Nordau, there was a steamship used to go around the lake, Lake Tiberias, called the Nordau. Here's Chevron, uh, Yafo, Jaffa. And here's some stamps that were uh, issued by Israel uh, in 2001. And this on the corner of Allenby Street, Beit Lederberg, you've got this absolutely gorgeous, here's a photograph of it, a set of ceramics of Jerusalem. Uh, and you can see the Pasuk, Odevnech, which we saw as being taken, Evnech, and if that, um, for the symbol of, of Tel Aviv, that I'm going to build you and you will be built. And here's the Bialik house, Chaim Nachman Bialik, the poet of Israel. And again, you look at these colors, they, they just sing to you. It's just joyful. What would I give to live in such a house if you like this sort of style? And I, I admit that I do. Here's a photograph of Eisenberg, who's the man who runs the ceramics department. And here's Zahara Schatz, who is a, a child from... Um, uh, Shatz's his second marriage, uh, and she's going to become an artist as well. The symbol of Yad Vashem is designed by her. Uh, but 1929, unfortunately, there's the Wall Street crash. There's a world depression. Um, money is tight, and money has always been tight at the Bezalel School of Art. And unfortunately, the um, Bezalel School of Art has to close. So its iconic first period is 1906-1929. Um, and here's a self-portrait of Boris Schatz, who's not giving up uh, in 1930. And this is actually a Rabban um, metal work. And this is Schatz's uh, painting himself. And you can see one of his plaques behind. He's 64 years old and he's now going to schlep around. Actually, he's going to drive around America and in the boot of it, in the trunk of his car, I should say, in America, he's going to have works from the Basalo School of Art and he's going to try and sell it. But uh, you can see here, 1932, uh, unfortunately, he has a heart attack and he dies. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a six-month battle. Six months, he's in a morgue in the States because there's no money to bring him home. And in the end, the Yishuv puts up the money to fly him home to Israel where he gets buried. But six months, he's actually left in a morgue in the States with the family fighting um, the people here. Now, I'm very, very near the end. And there's a four-minute film. And I think I'm going to pinch three minutes, if you don't mind, and show you this because it's really iconic. So I'm actually going to stop sharing and then I'm going to share screen again. Um, and I'm going to um, make sure that I click on the right one. And hopefully you can now see this film. I'm going to start it. Uh, 
moving. Now, this is the first advert ever taken in movies from Palestine, if you want, 1911. And it's set up by Boris Schatz um, and Murray Rosenberg, who's actually the Honorary Secretary of the English Zionist Federation, taking in 1911. Here's the door, the entrance to the Batsalel. And these tourists, including Murray Rosenberg's wife, Hilda, are going to come along. Here they are in their Mercedes Benz. And they're going to be welcomed by the guard. And now the next man out the door is going to be Boris Schatz with his pith helmet, welcoming them. And he's number two at the school. And hello to Mrs. Hilda Rosenberg, come in. This is going to be used as a promo. Um, and in they go to the Batsalo School of Art. Amazing that we actually have this film and it's available to us to see. And we're going to take a quick tour, a very, very short tour round. And here's, uh, we're in the workshops with the girls working, predominantly girls working at the looms. And they're being shown round. We'll see some uh, drawing classes as well on the left. It's all very busy, busy. Now, what's the purpose of this? Well, you always, whenever you go and see a site, even until today, you're always led out. We call it in England, exit via the gift shop. You're always going to be led out through the gift shop. And that's exactly what's going to happen at Salel. And you're going to buy your stuff to remember your visit and take home with you. And that's how they raise the funds to keep themselves going. Right? The same as a museum today, if you want. In fact, he's going to establish a museum in the Batsalo School of Art. And here's Chad Gadya, right? the painting we know. He's going to establish a museum. And it's going to become the National Museum of Israel. The Israel Museum today directly comes from the Batsalo School of Art. And here's Glickenstein's um, statue. And they've taken a Jerusalemite to show the old, if you want, uh, religious. Now here's Montefiore's carriage, which actually never traveled. Moses Montefiore came to Israel in 1827. He made a few trips. He never actually traveled in this carriage on the roads of Jerusalem. Um, but but Salel Schatz, uh, Boris Schatz, sorry, brought this over. Um, and there's Mrs. Rosenberg having a look. And here's Boris Schatz with his young students around him. Um, and again, uh, these photographs are used very much to promote. Wouldn't you want to give money and support these young people we're educating? And here's a, a fun day, shall we say, at Batsalel in Israel. They call it a Yom Kef, where you've got here the first photographer, Ben Dov. Um, and again, amazing, this man, because of this film, actually asked to get a Sydney film so he can start taking photography, and there's a lot of it. You see something, you don't see this very much in the Jewish world being fit. Here's the gym teacher showing this is the new Jew, the fit Jew, right? Keep your, your what is it, uh, a healthy body and a healthy mind, right? And we'll see here Boris Schatz and his number two in their pith helmets and their, I mean, it's very much showmanship. Here's Boris Schatz with the, your Jerusalemite. Um, and again, you can see the fun they're all having. This is a major institution in Jerusalem. The religious come and visit they interact. And from this, they're giving an identity, an artistic identity. And much of the art that we sort of take for granted today, like Migdal David. And of course, at the end of the trip, via gift shop, here are the people exiting with the stuff they have bought at the gift shop. Um, and very theatrically, you're going to see Boris Shah. Here's a huge piece he's taking home. Here's Boris Shatz coming out. And he's going to now close the door. And that'll be the end of this clip of film and our trip to see the real Batsalo School of Art in 1911. And here he's going to close the door. He'll wish us one last goodbye. Thank God they've gone and I can get back to work, he says. And that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. I thank you for your forbearance. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you. And good night. Thank you, but as you, hello.